All right, g'day, g'day. Welcome back to Collectivitis, a podcast where we dissect the disease that is collectivism. My name's Pietro. This is Max. How are you doing, Max? Pretty good, Pietro. How's things? Things are good. Things are good. I get to talk economics today with an economist. So, um, yeah, a little nervous because uh, I do like economics, but I am possibly going to show all of the areas where I, I don't have a clue what I'm talking about today in the um. Yeah, the gaps in my knowledge. So a little nervous, but definitely excited. We've um, yeah. So we've got a guest, and uh, let's get straight into it. Uh, she is an economics professor at University of New South Wales. She was the co-writer of the Great COVID Panic, 2019 Young Economist of the Year, and co-founder of Australians for Science and Freedom. She's also a regular. Uh, on various ABC shows, including Q and A, so she delves right into the depths of the collectivists and um, talks to them. I suppose I, I don't know exactly what happens when you delve into the depths of collectivists, um, but I will welcome her. So, uh, welcome to the show, Gigi Foster. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on, Pietro. Absolute pleasure. So, my my first question is: uh, How does one become the Young Economist of the Year? How do you uh, attain <laughs> that illustrious title? Yeah, so uh, this is an award that's given out um, annually, I think, or maybe every two years, and sometimes they don't even give it out at all, uh, by an organization that is called the Economic Society of Australia. It's a professional association and a national level thing. And so basically what happens is branches in each of the states submit names that they think are worthy of getting this award. And there's a number of other awards as well. There's a Distinguished Service Award and um, you know a few other ones. And uh, so then those names are sent to the Central Council and some kind of, uh, you know, shamanic dance is done and, and a, a name comes out. Um, so I'm not really sure. I actually didn't think I would get it um, at all. I was not expecting to get it. And in fact, I wasn't even told that I was getting it until I was at the conference where it was being given out. Um, I happened to be there because I was giving a paper. This conference is the Australian Conference of Economists, which is the uh, Economic Society of Australia's annual conference. So I had to very quickly come up with some sort of acceptance speech at, at the you know half an hour at lunchtime. Uh, and so I did, and I gave the speech and I got the award, but um, it's, it's one of those things that you don't, you're not told necessarily, I guess, that, uh, you know, that you're, that you're being considered. Uh, and I think I was only the second woman to get it. We've, we've had them, we've had the awards going since, gosh, I don't know, sometime in the early 2000s or so. Um, and mostly it's given to people who have published in quote unquote elite or top journals a lot. Um, I've not done that that much. I mean, I've published in journals, obviously, because you have to, but I'm, I don't have this sort of fanatical obsession with the top five, you know, journals like American Economic Review and, and uh, you know, Quarterly Journal of Economics, because basically, I don't think that a lot that gets published in those outlets is really that helpful to the world. And I guess I see my brief as more trying to be helpful to the world with my research. And so I don't really prioritize that. It's also very hard to get into those journals. So the opportunity cost of trying is very high. What that means is that what you give up uh, when you have to try to get into those journals is a lot of time and effort that could be spent someplace else, right? Doing something else. So so I think I was given it, if I remember the citation, I was given it not as much for my academic um, contributions as for my community engagement and my teaching and sort of all around, um, I guess, broad perspective. I'm, I'm kind of a generalist and, and uh, it was nice to get an award like that, which uh, is not usually given to uh, my kind of profile of person. So I was very happy. It was kind of, you know, I guess in some sense it's peer voted. Uh, that's what we're told at least. Yeah, that was going to be my... Um sort of question was it sounds like it's something that's done by other economists rather than some sort of centralized uh, government type of decision in which case I said you know I would assume maybe they'd look at someone other than yourself uh, given what you've been uh, advocating for which uh, we obviously agree with well but remember um, 2019 was pre-COVID right so true um... <laughs> I think in a way, you know, the, the ESA was a bit shocked and alarmed by what happened, you know, to their little choice uh, after COVID. In fact, I had to give a speech as the Young Economist of the Year in, I think it was 2021 at the, usually the, the Young Economist gives the speech the next year, but of course the 2020 conference was canceled. So I was on the, on the docket to give a, a speech and, you know, not an acceptance speech, but just a, you know, honorary talk what you want about to talk about sort of thing. 
in 2021. And of course, I talked about COVID policy because that was the obvious thing to talk about that very few other economists had actually brought up in their comments. I hadn't really engaged with the community and they certainly hadn't, if they had engaged, they hadn't been saying that it was a bad idea to do these things, generally speaking. So um, so that was a bit of a shock and awe uh, presentation, I, I think. Um, people were a bit shocked. <laughs> um, but coming out of that, I actually wrote a paper together with Paul Friders, who also presented at that conference um, called Hiding the, Hiding the Elephant, I think it's called, Hiding the Elephant, um, the tragedy of our COVID response and um, the apologies of economists for it or something like that. And that paper is due to be published soon, amazingly, in one of the economic society journals. So, uh, so you know, we got a publication out of it, it looks like. Um, I mean, I, I, there's many a slip between cup and lip, but I think we're basically there. We've finished with the referee reports. So, but that was a pretty harrowing journey because in that paper, we basically call out by name all the economists who were in the cheerleading squad for the lockdowns and all of the other nonsense during COVID and um, and name how few there were of us who actually stood up and, and said that this was a bad idea. So, you know, some really people who really should get some applause, you know, Henry Urgas and um, Jonathan Pincus and a, a number of other people, maybe a dozen or so who stood up in Australia against all the madness. It's funny that you say in 2021, not many other inco- uh, economists, sorry, were um, talking about the COVID response, um, because I'm sure they're going to be talking about it for decades to come now. Of course, right? We've got decades worth of material, not just for ourselves to talk about, but for PhD studies, right? And not just in economics, but in psychology and in political science and health, right? I mean, my goodness, we have filled the coffers of, um, you know, <laughs> PhD, wannabe PhD and master students who are looking for a topic, right? This is what you should study because <laughs> it's not been fully analyzed yet, right? We haven't fully come to terms with what's happened. You know, people are still psychologically blocked and scarred and can't talk to each other and, uh, you know, and, and still using ridiculous, stupid labels, you know, like, I don't even know what some of these labels mean. Neoliberal, I don't know what that means. Anti-vax, what does that even mean? Does that mean that you, you know, I mean, these things like, they seem like ideologies. They're not scientific, you know, they're not, they're not actually informative and you're not capturing any kind of nuance in the human experience and, and policymaking, the difficulties of policymaking, which is always in a gray zone. It's never a black and white scenario. You know, We've just become so puerile in the way that we talk to each other and the way that we think about policy. So my goodness, do we have a lot of work to do. And, and I think academia can help with that, but uh, you know, I gotta say it's not putting its best foot forward necessarily at the moment, uh, which is why it's great to do podcasts like this. You know, The independent media have really come on during this period. and. You guys are, are are showing the world, you know, what you can do when you just speak freely and, and how that can really influence people's minds. And if you influence people's minds, you know, that's that's the start of changing the world. Like we uh, oh, just to um, sort of further that point, we saw that the the mainstream media and all the, the um, traditional media sources were so captured that there had to be a, a response because otherwise we would, you know, we were doomed that we would never hear the other voices. Um, I, I did want to ask, uh, so the something that's fascinating to me about, about economics is that there are so many schools, so many theories, so many different, um, uh, completely different worldview worlds about uh, this, what should be uh, a science that can be measured and, and um, essentially figured out is, is my impression, something that is, is tangible and, and kind of uh, predictable. And yet, because there are so many different schools and thoughts, the there is kind of this um, this outcome. The outcome, I suppose, is that politicians can pick and choose which economics suits them, and therefore do whatever they want because there is there are as many economic theories as they need to to service their needs. And I I think COVID is a shocking example of that because everywhere you turned there was an expert telling you that the opinion that you held is wrong and how do you argue with an expert if uh, if the others are silent so i just wanted a little bit of insight like what was it like being in that world of economics when this was happening like that must have been insane yeah i mean that's what you just said is full of stuff that we can unpack um First of all, yes, there are many, many different schools of thought in economics. And the reason for that is because we are a much dif- more difficult discipline than something like physics. Because in physics, you know, you drop a ball, it is going to go down if you're on the earth, right? Or I mean, if you're on the moon, it'll still go down as, you know, less fast, right? And and so it's funny, my son is a physicist and a, and a musician, and he and I sometimes talk about 
you know, how easy it is in a way to sort of just set up problems in physics compared to in something like economics, where you've got all of these actors who, you know, thank goodness are free to act, right? I mean, I'm on a libertarian podcast, so I can say that. But <laughs> that means that we we can't predict really what they're going to do, right? We can kind of think that we maybe sort of can sometimes mostly, but, you know, we're often wrong, just like many other models of, of very highly dynamic, complex um, endogenous processes are extremely difficult to model. So too are the processes affecting people's behavior. And of course, people are influenced by groups as well. And so in the economy, you have uh, various institutions and, and you know groups that are putting pressure on people and setting rules, implicit and explicit. People change as they age, right? People change in terms of their preferences and their um, potential, their resources and their um, their outlook, you know, the way that they that they believe the future is going to unfold, right? And your expectations about the future are incredibly important to your behavior. And so every, and, and you know, who knows what your expectations are of the future? I don't know that. But if I have to come up with a model of what's going to happen tomorrow, I kind of have to make assumptions about what that is, what that expectation is that you hold in your mind, which I can't see. It's an incredibly difficult discipline, right? And so this is why we end up having things like, you know, the freshwater school and the saltwater school, you know, the Hayekians and the Keynesians and whatnot, because there are different ways of thinking about how do you get the most good happiness, production, welfare, whatever for people, given the scarce resources we have. And that's the basic economic question. And it's not that economists differ on wanting to answer that question well. It's just that there are legitimately different ways of thinking about the policies that are likely to be best to deliver that based on what you think about how people form expectations and what people really want and, and how groups influence people and how people are going to respond to different kinds of news. You know, there's all these different assumptions that we have. Uh, and, you know, the, one of the biggest ones you may be aware of is the sort of the Keynesians versus the Hayekians, which basically says, you know, the Keynesians will say, if the economy is in a slump, the government needs to come in and start spending so that we can get money into people's pockets and sort of, you know, the, 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 the New Deal was a good example of this back in the States, right, in the, after the uh, Depression. And some people say that that really helped putting people in work, getting them money to feed their families, and they were building things like the Hoover Dam and whatever, right? And we still use those things today. Other people say, well, you know, really what helped to get the U.S. out of depression was the Second World War. If that hadn't happened, we would still be, you know, kind of dragging our feet and that the government expenditure actually crowded out private expenditure that would have otherwise happened. And, and therefore, you know, we would have actually had more growth in a counterfactual scenario. That's the Hayekian kind of critique, right? Which which says basically in a in a recession, the government's got to get out of the way and let businesses figure out how to do things, put together factors of production, and actually make products. The issue with that, of course, is that the Keynesians will say is, well, if you can't coordinate expectations, if you can't, if the government can do nothing to sort of say, hey, things are going to be better next year, then businesses may not take any risks. They may not have an incentive to go out and put together those factors of production and start taking, you know, some 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 kind of investment opportunities that might or might not pay off because that's, uh, you know, that's a more risky position. And we know that the general slump versus the general, you know, general glut is the way that Keynes said it, versus a, a, a period in which everybody's feeling bullish and happy has a very different feel to it. All right. It has a, a different feel on the street. People taking a lot of risks versus people really playing close to their chest and just trying to get by. So you can see that expectations are really important and how you think those expectations are formed and what role the government really has and what's going to happen if the government takes action. You can have, you know, rational, reasonable people can disagree about these things. So that's why we've got what we've got in economics, which is a lot of different schools of thought with lots of different policy advice for different kinds of scenarios. Now, in COVID, you asked me, what's it like? What was it like to be in that mix? I mean, first of all, I will say 95% of the economists who went on the air or said anything about COVID at the time agreed that JobKeeper, which was a massive kind of Keynesian type policy, giving people money, um, was a good idea. And when it came out, I thought it was a good idea, too, because the economy had just been forcibly brought to a halt by the government, right? The government had basically just taken bread out of people's mouths. And I didn't think ethically, morally, it was okay to do that. I mean, I didn't think they should have done that in the first place, but I thought conditional on doing that, you can't just let people starve. You know, you have to help them somehow. So 
yeah, I guess we need to pay some money into their bank accounts, right? And so that's what we did with JobKeeper. Now, of course, JobKeeper lasted way longer than it should have. And it was taken advantage of as any big honeypot program is taken advantage of by all sorts of parties that it was not intended to be uh, benefiting. <laughs> um, and particularly in Australia, that happens. And so, you know, I, I quickly became not a fangirl of, of JobKeeper, but it was something that that most of my profession thought was perfectly fine. And in fact, most of the profession went along with the lockdowns, not because they had models themselves that the lockdowns were a good idea, but because epidemiologists who also, like economists, sometimes only see a very narrow part of the world, were coming out with models that said that lockdowns were somehow the only thing that we could do, or at least they thought that, you know, based on their SIR models, their, their susceptible infected recovered kinds of models, we were gonna have huge numbers of people dying if we didn't do something big. And politicians, I think, kind of latched on to the political reality that their populations were asking for saving from COVID and that something big was required. And so lockdowns were a big thing and that's what got done. Um, to this day, however, no government around the world that I know of has actually proven in any way that I think is credible or robust that lockdowns on net were a good idea in terms of net benefiting human welfare. So, and every every cost benefit analysis I've seen uh, have, that's been done reasonably, you know, remotely robustly has found that they, they, the lockdowns cost way more than they benefited us. So they were a political move, but the, but the economists, unfortunately, just like you were saying, I think kind of felt like they had to stay in their lane somehow and not say something against the lockdowns because it was the health people, the epidemiologists who were dictating terms in some sense and providing the support for the politicians who decided to go into lockdowns. So, so it was a weird period to be in because I felt that as a generalist economist, I had a view of the whole picture that was reasonably okay and certainly broader than the epidemiologists who were trotting out these stupid models that, that basically only looked at the benefit, possible benefit, and didn't look at any cost of lockdowns at all, right? And I thought, well, at least I'm looking at the costs, right? I mean, that's broader than just looking at the benefits, but somehow nobody else was looking at that. Nobody was caring about that, which was a psychological dysfunction that I later recognized as being a, a, a kind of a symptom of the crowd phenomenon, which we have seen in human history, but I had never lived through. But having this crowd form around the COVID cult, the COVID fanaticism meant that people just didn't see many of the things that in normal times were considered important. And those things were just swept under the carpet, completely ignored. And anybody who would bring them up was called a, a neoliberal Trump cannot death cult warrior like me. So, <laughs> um, did you? So normally, like the start of our interviews, we would ask our guests how they came to, to libertarianism or their certain political beliefs if they're from the other side of the spectrum. Um, one thing I well, generally most people's political views are formed from um, economics or social issues or another certain topic. Do you find even pre-COVID that your political beliefs uh, would have been influenced by your knowledge of economics? Um, and also on that, where do you sit within the philosophy of libertarianism, um, either for or against so the things you agree with or you don't agree with? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I make a point of, of um, being and, and also caretaking an image of being politically independent. So I don't pick horses in political races. And, I, and that, the reason for that is really that I want to maintain my ability to, to credibly give independent advice. Um, and I have been contacted in the past by, by politicians or politicians' aides um, from different parties, you know, a lot of different parties on both the rest, left and the right spectrum. Um, I've, I've thought of myself as basically center-ish on, on average for a long time. Uh, if you think about the left-right spectrum, I don't even know what left and right mean anymore, though, honestly. I mean, Not many of us do. I, just, I don't think that make any sense anymore. Um, I definitely have always, uh, ever since I was a child, uh, felt that it was better to have a system of free enterprise rather than a system of central planning. And the reason for that is because I studied uh, Russian and the Russian political system when I was uh, in high school and college. In fact, my, um, my senior thesis in university was on Gorbachev's perestroika. And, uh, and so I, I was really a fan of, of sort of understanding how that went wrong, how all that went wrong. And because, you know, communism and, and sort of central planning generally often appeals to people who really care about um, 
you know, people who are down, downtrodden and they want to help those downtrodden people. And the idea is, well, those people need money. We need to give those people money or they need opportunities. We need to give them opportunities. You know, we collectively need to give them opportunities. And so it's a very seductive thing. And I am, I do have a very soft heart, right? I love people, love, love, love people. I hate seeing people suffer. So when I was a very small girl, um, I had an uncle actually, who was uh, very communist. I mean, really like 100% communist. And I loved him so much. You know, he was a sweetheart and, and never would hurt a fly. He was the most kind gentleman I've ever, ever known and probably, you know, helped me to develop my own gentleness in that way. And, and certainly taught me to, to trust men. And I mean, all sorts of wonderful things. But as I grew, I realized that it was so um, uh, <laughs> immature to think that somehow that loving sharing attitude that we have in a family or a small group could scale to a, a society level right like a national level and i saw the destruction that the soviet union brought about in in their peoples right i mean the the starving in um you know in the ukrainian uh you know uh, farm disasters and then of course you know the stalin purges and you know the political stuff you know the gulags and then you know just the incredible waste of the bureaucracy right this whole system that everybody had to end up working around because of the incentives for innovation and for efficient production were essentially just beaten out of the system there were no more incentives to produce in a reasonable way to produce as much as possible for the least input, right? Which is the economic goal, right? You're trying to be efficient because you want to get the most for everybody. You just can't do that at a, at a large scale if you have central planning, because the people who have the information about how to do that are at the local level, not at the central level. And those that local information has got to be used. You have to have an institutional structure that allows that information to be used at the local level level that the guy on the street the man on the street has to be able to make a decision about whether to open his shop today or whether to you know bake more scones or make you know another three pairs of boots or whatever it is right the central committee or whoever it is at the central point cannot possibly know that because of the limits to monitoring we just don't have enough resources to monitor to that level and and those those signals are always changing there's dynamic changes every single day and in everything the labor markets and capital markets and your customer base and your expectations about what's going to happen tomorrow those expectations are really valuable they're they are what makes the economy's engine go so I think, you know, since I was at least maybe 18 or so, I, I have recognized that it was a better system to have the, the free market enterprise system instead of the, the central planning system. Um, but apart from that, in terms of particular social issues or questions or, you know, economic questions, I, I try to basically choose what I think will work best for people. So I don't like to you know slap a label on myself. I, I have a lot of sympathy for the libertarian position on some things. Certainly, um, I definitely believe in, for example, you know, one's uh, autonomy to make choices about one's own body. You know, what to what to eat, what to drink, what to um, take as medical uh, you know procedures. Um, and I find it abhorrent that a, that a state would come down and dictate that you must have a particular medical procedure, for example, or you you know you must take a particular kind of medicine. I think that's just awful. Um, it's basically being a slave, right? You're giving away your own body as a violation of your bodily autonomy. Um, so I really don't like that. Um, uh, but I also, you know, think that there are some things where clearly when we work together, we can achieve more. And in my, in my history, you know, of people I've, I've worked with, one of the one of my fondest friends is um, Jeffrey Tucker, who who founded the Brownstone Institute. I don't know if you guys know of this guy, but when COVID began, he was working for the American Institute for Economic Research. He was a staff writer, um, and he had published many books in the past. And uh, he was basically a libertarian thinker, although I might even say he's a, an anarchist, really, even further uh, uh, in that direction. And he was the person who, in May 2021, after I sent him the draft of the Great COVID Panic came back to me saying, I stayed up all night reading this book. I must publish this book. And I said to him, well, Jeffrey, do you have a publishing house? Like, as far as I know, you're just a peon writer, you know, who are you? And he's like, no, 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 I have these plans to, you know, start a new institute about COVID and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, well, hopefully that works out because our plan was to self-publish because we knew that no publishing house would touch our manuscript with a barge pole, right? And then on suit about eight weeks of this very, roller coaster sort of experience where it was on again off again he didn't know whether he'd get the money and maybe he could maybe he couldn't and anyway finally there was a yes and we gave him the, the manuscript on the first of august and then on the first of september the great COVID panic was the first title published by brownstone institute 
And I love Jeffrey. He's wonderful, right? He's just an amazing figure. And what he has done with that institute is absolutely astonishing. Uh, so I would commend it to all your listeners to go just brownstone.org. You can, you can have a look. Um, but in my private conversations with him, I have found that he finds it difficult to envision situations in which working together on a grand scale will deliver a, a positive net benefit for people. Um, and it's a, it's a typical sort of libertarian issue. There's a, there's a real hesitancy, a fear of putting together a large organization because you're afraid it's going to just run away with itself, right? And, and it's going to become just really a problem, right? But if I ask myself, is there a role for large organizations, you know, large structures in our modern society? Yes, I think there is because of returns to scale and the, the efficiency, therefore, with which you can produce things like national defense, let's say or even, you know, a health system. Um, and, and even to a certain extent, some education inputs. I mean, I don't think that the state should be necessarily as involved in education as it is now, but there is a way of coordinating national education programs that I think that the government could could play, could play that role. Um, and so I think it's, it's more a question of setting those institutions up in a way that oversight and accountability is much, much, much more heavily emphasized than it is now. During COVID, we saw bureaucrats at the head of these large organizations just running away with their power, right? They got more power than they ever dreamed imaginable, and they were completely unaccountable to the people, and they were responsible for policies that, that just destroyed huge amounts of human welfare in this society. It's criminal what happened there. And, and we didn't have any accountability mechanisms for these people. <laughs> so, so part of what I'm going for now in my efforts to try to rebuild Australia with others, not just myself, right, but in collaboration with other people, is to think about edits and tweaks to the way that we run large organizational or institutional features of our society so that we have more accountability, so that we're less likely to fall into that situation where people just run away with power, which we know is basically a hard drug. So we have to keep our eye much more on the ball when people have a lot of power. It's a very, very bad situation to be in when when you have concentrated power. Yeah, uh, and I, again, there's there's a lot there. Uh, let me try and sort of think what to respond to first. We are a libertarian podcast. Let me push back a little bit in the, in defense of uh, of libertarianism. I don't know that necessarily um, libertarians would say that we are against working together or against large. Um, institutions or groups i'd say it's um the much what, what what i would perceive is the much more is the libertarian position is that we would be against uh, as long as they are voluntary like the 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 requirement is that there is voluntary association in all of these things so you know if there is a large organization that is propped up by the state or that ha has you know achieves a monopoly somehow by using the state which you don't have to look very far to see that they are everywhere right now, that is an example of where a libertarianism would a libertarian would scoff. Um, I don't know that you know. I I, I think libertarianism is almost um, more optimistic of humans being able to work together, in that you know we could do it through nothing more than incentives and voluntary association and you know money <laughs> and the free yeah. market. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's a very good point. And, and I, I do understand that I probably should have made that clearer. I guess my issue with that is just that you and I and, uh, and Max here, you know, we are extremely lucky, uh, smart people. We've got a lot of resources. We have the time in the day to think about all of the things that we would like to have in our life and to voluntarily associate potentially with other people to achieve those ends, right? Great, we're so friggin' privileged, right? If I think about 15 to 20% of the population of Australia, the other end of Australia, where you have overlapping disadvantage, you have people just trying to feed their families, just trying to get through the day without being hit uh, or being able to go to sleep with a full belly, right? Not knowing where they're gonna sleep tomorrow. I mean. These people, to ask them on top of everything else that they're trying to deal with in their own personal circle of life, to then figure out whether they want to have their garbage picked up by that association or this other association, and would you like to have your this school or that school for your kid? It's I feel like it's just a, a bridge too far. So, so I I, I very much I have a, a lot of sympathy for the position that voluntary association is great and I, as i say i do think that the government has 
really overreached horrifically during COVID and even before COVID in Australia. I think it was kind of way beyond brief. Um, but I do think that there is a brief for the government to offer some things that not everybody has necessarily explicitly signed up for because there's going to be a clutch of people in the society who just don't have the capacity because we're just not yet at that stage in development. We haven't eradicated that kind of poverty yet, that kind of disadvantage yet. Uh, they don't have the capacity to to do the kind of choosing, to use that, that they don't have any resources to, to you know, use in order to be the libertarian ideal person uh, and and you know, make these selections and voluntarily decide to do this, that, or the other thing, right? And they just need the peace of mind and the security to be able to have something in their life that's fixed they can rely on, and then they try to fix their problems. You could also argue that a lot of people are in these disadvantaged positions because of the government. Absolutely. Totally agree. And totally agree. I, I think, uh, like, that, that is, a lot of people would inherently... Uh, agree with that with that statement you know i, I don't want to i'm i'm glad to pay my taxes because it means that i don't have to think about you know this this and this the other and i'll know that someone is looking after whatever and you know i know that if i get injured there's there will be a hospital um and this is uh i think we we can maybe agree that that is that that is uh, something that a lot of people find desirable but i also uh it would be remiss not to not to say that the government exploits this idea so enormously you know it's the by by saying hey we'll provide you these certain things that uh you know you couldn't live without or that you know you don't have to think about that way they are uh they create as you, as you said not only those things and they they siphon out far more wealth than those things uh are otherwise worth through either taxes or through inflation and debt as as we're currently seeing and then they create these enormous webs of bureaucracy for all of these things. And, and this just feeds and grows. So it's, it's like as much as it's a, it's a nice sentiment, like with the, the, the communism idea, it's a nice sentiment to think, hey, uh, we want to look after everyone. It, wouldn't it be really lovely if everyone is looked after? But when there is centralized power like that, the incentives for them are to grow and to continuously siphon and expand to the point where I think where we are today, it's where we are today is, is and maybe you can confirm or deny this, we're going to be the first generation that is poorer in terms of our purchasing ability than our parents, despite the the technological revolution that, you know, we live in the most advanced world ever, and yet we are poorer. And I can't see any culprit uh, to this other than the the state state's expansion and that, that siphoning by using uh, positive sort of feel good messages. Yeah, no, very well articulated. And I think you're exactly right. That is, I mean, the, the, the ultimate goal of any bureaucracy is to survive and expand, right? That is just true. And we've known this for, you know, generations now. So again, we have kept our eye off the ball, particularly in Australia. We've just not monitored the people who have the power and and real power is in these bureaucracies real power right and so we just don't have any mechanisms to hold these people to account um and to and to limit their growth so you're absolutely right and I, and I think there is going to be inefficiency that we have to deal with it's sort of similarly to the way you have to deal with inefficiency if you have a group of very um, diverse thinkers you know you aren't going to get to a conclusion as quickly as if you have people coming to the table who all share the same beliefs about how you should proceed, you know, that'll be a quick meeting, but you're not going to experience in the longer run as much innovation as you do if you accommodate the diversity of thought and you actually let people speak who have different ideas. So, so it's, it's one of those really, you know, difficult questions. And I don't think there's, you know, it's a gray area. I don't think that we should have no government, but I also don't think that we should have nearly as much as we have now. And I think there are different, again, structural elements. For example, just yesterday, I went to a, a seminar at my university um, about the uh, an innovation in the UK education system, whereby there are these new free schools, what are called free schools, which are being started by people, uh, different groups, I mean, community groups or parental groups or, you know, uh, businesses sometimes that each have a philosophy of education that's that's quite distinct and they put themselves in the market and they say this is what we're doing they get government support they get government funding same amount that any other public school gets but they have full autonomy 
to decide on the on the, the type of you know education that's going to be provided and parents can then choose across these different schools so the parent the, the parents are still getting a resource that they know is going to be there there's going to be schools right and you have to make a limited choice so you know maybe three or four different schools that are in you know spitting distance of your house or whatever and that you have to say well would this would my child be best suited to this school or that school or that school the government is there it's helping it's providing funding because you know that's that's sort of still a government education program so it's not like you know these schools could just go under because the business that's running it goes under right it's the government will continue to support schools that that achieve success by having enrollments that are sufficient to get enough government funding so there is a competitive aspect there you have to get enough enrollments to qualify but you know there there is still choice so so that kind of model is the kind of thing that i think we we need to be thinking about more um and and of course to supplement with with private choices whenever possible in education in health and in lots of other areas child care i mean my goodness child care is such a ridiculous you know a ridiculously mismanaged <laughs> sector i think at the moment where you know parents who would love to be able to put their kids in a in a family daycare for example with a, a woman who has been a mother knows how to parent kids, can have six kids in her home and around the corner from the house, you know, oh no, that's, you know, can't do, cannot get, you know, certified or whatever, right? And the certification systems, oh my gosh, you know, talk about more bureaucracy and you have to, you know, conform to all of these special little rules and whatnot, which really don't have that much to do at the end of the day with producing a happy, well-adjusted child who is ready for school, right? So having been in the US with my kids, my own kids, when they were small, it was so much easier to find that kind of daycare. And so now, one of the big things that is pressing down the fertility rate uh, is I think that it just is all so hard to find, first of all, to find housing that's that's affordable, as you know, as young people, and also then to find daycare for your child that you can trust, you think is, you know, is accessible, it's not too expensive, uh, and, is, and is actually something that, that will enrich their lives. So that sort of stuff shouldn't be so hard, you know, as you say, in the modern age, with all the technology we have, and all that we've learned about how to make happy humans you know we why are we not putting that stuff that those learnings into practice and so i do agree with you guys that the government has just overreached way too much and we need to think about new systems and, and new ways to uh structure the the government's involvement and also to retain and, and enhance and build the oversight that the democratic public have over the um the operations of these bureaucracies so um this kind of harkens back to, to uh, w what we were talking about at the very beginning of this, because it harkens back to my original point that, um, you know, we can all agree that childcare being uh, overregulated is, um, in, you know, enormous bureaucracies. These are all parts of the reason why uh, the world and, and, and young people and everyone is finding it so difficult economically. And it would seem to me that this is something that economists, and this is what I mean by, you know, there should be predictable and there should be things that are certainties. Like, it seems to me that these sort of things should be, there should be an, a consensus amongst economists that these are the things that are hurting. And I don't understand why there isn't, because uh, if you look at policy from both sides of, of um, you know, uh, from both sides of the political spectrum, they are uh, moving in the opposite direction. I think in Australia, particularly, that's true. And one of the reasons is because we have a particularly cowardly populace and a populace that's particularly um, fond of just taking government orders and doing what the government says, right? And, and trusting that whatever pretty wrapping the government has put upon its programs is sort of, you know, more than skin deep. And, and that's just, as you know, it's just not true. But I think there's a this, this sort of gun shyness, the risk aversion of things like the overregulation of child care. Uh, for example, you know, the, the defense is often used, well, if the government doesn't regulate child care, then you might have people entering the child care market who are pedophiles or are otherwise going to mistreat or neglect children. And wouldn't that be horrific? We can't have that on our watch. Therefore, we must have the government come in and make sure that everything's fine. Now, first of all, the, the making sure isn't necessarily achieved. Right? I mean, there's a lot of hoo-ha dance made about the regulations, but is, is, is it true that the regulations are really preventing neglect of children in these homes you know i mean the government cannot afford to put a personal monitor 
you know, a watcher in every single childcare facility, right? And in fact, the childcare facilities may spend more time and effort dealing with the regulations than selecting good staff because you got to deal with the regulations, right? We have this problem in the university system too. When you have a lot of regulations, it's basically there's a crowding out of attention and resources towards things that really would be helpful, right? And would actually achieve the, the goal. Interview or to visit the childcare place and sniff it out and figure out whether it looks like there's you know problems here or whether this looks like a comfortable place for my child uh, and to continue to monitor that. There's also no thought that maybe we could have an independent monitoring body of some sort, you know, a consumer protection agency or something um, that was that maybe even consumers could pay to be part of where you get ratings from these, this place. You know, I mean, there's all sorts of different structures that one could imagine other than simply the government coming in and putting up a bunch of regulations. So I think there's just a kind of lack of thinking it through, lack of understanding of possible alternatives, a risk aversion and a proclivity to just uh, to believe daddy when daddy says that this is the way to do it, you know, and it's unfortunate. I've, I've really learned that during this COVID period in Australia, the cowardice and the the sort of cravenness of, of Australian people towards the, whatever the government says. It's uh, It's been quite a despairing time in that sense for me. Yeah, we've really shone through in in our ability to to trust the um you know the appeal to authorities here have been uh, something very scary. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh about education then, because I'm a high school teacher. You, you work in a, in a university, and I think uh, in a way, um, universities are almost like a uh, a microcosm a microcosm of um government of uh you know what what government does and, and how it works uh essentially like my view is that um and i'd love to hear your opinion on this as well is um what the government has done is it's created uh like this false market for universities where every uh employer needs to tick off uh that their employees have this university degree and therefore it's created this enormous industry of uh, um, not only the, the academics, but also all the bureaucrats around them who um, th there's there's such an enormous like funneling of money into this enormous enterprise, um, which most people, I would argue, most people don't actually need to go to university at all. But the, the moment you suggest something like that, it's you, you're denying education and you're denying, you know, equal rights to, to learn things. And it makes you sound like some kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, crazy, uh, you know, backwards, um, whatever. So yeah. what, what do you think of that? Yeah, no, totally. I mean, the, the, you get accused, I think, of being an elitist if you are against mm. education today. And uh, and that's really unfortunate because, I mean, the way that I like to say it is, is from the flip side, I would really like to have more plumbers, electricians, bricklayers, and glass blowers to choose from when something breaks. There are plenty of people who have a university degree struggled to string a sentence together and certainly couldn't a doorbell, you know. So I think we should try as a society, if, if possible, if the government has any role in this, to try to increase the status of people who don't go to university but are actually useful to the society. Um, and that's, you know, all sorts of different kinds of skilled and semi-skilled professions, um, including those that have apprenticeship models for, for learning and, and even just you know, casual work of all sorts that, that, that just goes into building the, 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 the society that we're in, you know, the buildings and the, the roads and everything else. We need people to feel that those jobs are real jobs. They're, they're successful jobs. They're good jobs and they are valued in the society. And what's not valued is to go, go and get a university degree and then, you know, sit on your plum because you can't find any place that really, you know, is, is a good place to work with your skills that actually doesn't think you're overqualified. Or when you do get there, maybe you don't even really know anything and you have to get trained on the job anyway, right? Which a lot of jobs, that's actually a better way to learn the job than going to university <laughs> to, to learn the job, you know? And we've just forgotten this. And so I think universities have really been successful in spinning this story that you know university is the only way the path to success and you know any any true child of potential will go to a university and so parents get sucked in by this story as well and and who pays the cost well us academics i hate to say and i mean you're a high school teacher so maybe you pay a bit as well if, if people are staying in high school longer than they need to but Certainly, I got a lot of kids in my first year classes who I have to question society that's paying my salary, um, you know, in a better position because you're here being educated by me than if you were at a TAFE or at a music school or at an apprenticeship somewhere or something like this. 
So, so this massification of education has meant a huge number of much more diverse learners in the classroom. And I don't mean just ethnically diverse or diverse in terms of what they believe, but diverse in terms of their ability, academic ability to do well, to understand abstractions, to, to keep up with you know, colloquial, fast-paced English, to um, create new things, you know, intellectual things, you know, ideas. Not everybody's cut out for that stuff. Even if you put a lot of effort in, you're still not going to necessarily be at the same level as somebody who is just naturally gifted at that. So uh, it's just a lot of effort, a lot of work, a lot of high cost education that we have foisted upon our academics. And at the same time, we've taken away a lot of the useful bureaucracy and replaced it with a lot of bloated bureaucracy. So one of the great stylized facts of the last 20 years is that in universities, A, the number of bureaucrats per faculty member, that is academic staff person, has gone up. And B, the bureaucrats that are there are now more likely to be centralized rather than localized. So, you know, you had used to be the model used to be that in a, in a particular department, you would have uh, a secretary who would be available to do things like take notes at meetings and, you know, sort the mail and stuff like that and help to greet visitors and stuff. And you'd also have somebody who was a finance officer who would handle the reimbursement requests and, and you know, manage people's credit cards and things. Then you'd have a travel and special events officer who would help you with your travel bookings and, you know, handle conference planning and things like this. And you might have one or two other people, maybe a learning and teaching administrator who would help you with the learning management, help you with, uh, you know, research applications or whatever. So you'd have a, you know, seven or eight different local administrators helping you in a department of, say, 40 uh, academic staff. And that would be pretty much it. You'd have a couple of people at the central office, you know, doing whole scale, whole uh, of university functions, but mostly it was administration at the local level. Now, today, what you get is a huge number of middle management and upper management uh, administrative flock uh, who do all sorts of things that seem very, very important, you know, mostly making up spreadsheets and being on the phone to each other and sending people's emails, right? And at the local level, you have very, very few actually helpful people. The people who are there are really overworked <laughs> and every because everybody wants a piece of them because everybody is basically under under provided with real support to do the things that, by the way, the university is selling as its main business model, right? The academics are the only people who are actually mm. productive. <laughs> in a university, right? The academics. Everybody else is there as a superstructure, as a as a support, a scaffolding somehow. But most of that scaffolding has been turned into a weapon and used against us in the sense that now we have to comply with all of these various processes and protocols and rules and regulations, again, with the argument that if we didn't have this, then students would be at risk, or the university's reputation would be at risk, or blah, blah, blah. So it's a, a system that lacks trust of its academics, does not operate upon the principle of trusting the judgment of people who have terminal degrees and have been in the job for 20 years, <laughs> speaking personally, right? So I'm not trusted to figure out how to educate, how to how to decide, how to describe a course to my students and then how to deliver it to my students. I have to be hold, held to a particular regimented way of doing these things. And I must fill in the blanks on the pro forma, right? The, the template, right? That's how that's how it's presented to me. And I, I have to comply. If I want to get my salary, that's what I have to do. I can't just teach the courses I would like to teach in the way that I would like to teach them. Now, there still is, of course, academic oversight over, you know, topics and, and the content of your courses, because at the end of the day, the administrators just cannot have that. But they can have dominion over a lot of other things from how you schedule the classes to what the rules are about how you how you what you have to put in your course outlines you know the information that has to be there the policies and procedures you have to help hold the students to about late assignments or you know special consideration or anything like this um and don't even get me started on the on the research side, right? There's the, the research ethics protocol stuff and um, all of the, the various grant application processes which have ballooned into these behemoths that now take up as much effort, if not more, than you would be sort of getting in equivalence if you won the grant. <laughs> so I haven't even applied for a, for a big grant for, gosh, probably probably nearly a decade because it's just a big, big, fat time sink. Right. And I can do most of the work that I want to do without big money anyway. So I just leave that to be competed for by ambitious young boys, basically. And I just do my work with my head down and just try not to make a fuss and don't lose all that time and effort putting in these applications. I mean, they take three months to put in an application for, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. It's just nuts. 
So, so the kind of bureaucracy that we have in education has created these 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 unbelievable inefficiencies, and have really they've they've just created huge um, you know necklaces of of lead on the, the the only people who are productive in higher education, which is the academics. Yeah, so a, a couple of points to to that. Um, it's it's like you said earlier. So the 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 university system, because of the fact that it's it's done, it's also compulsory, uh, has become this enormous honeypot of of you know government funding and money because they know that if you want to get a job anywhere, you have to go through this place. So and not everyone is skilled enough to be an academic. So naturally, the you know the <laughs> the parasites. Um, uh, cling to bureaucratic jobs and then if there's that many people in bureaucracy well they're going to do something they're going to do something to keep themselves busy and to you know um, consolidate their the reason for their position and their you know power um, and that's and that's when when this stuff um, you know when, when these regulations and these oversights and these you know micromanagement of the the, the um, academics um, occurs the, the other point is that it's also um, enormously harmful to to students who are now getting into you know thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt for something that's sold to them as you have to do this thing this is the right thing to do for your education and for yourself and for your growth and they're left at the end of it with with nothing with um you know they've lost some of the the most productive years of their of their younger younger lives they've gained all this knowledge that uh, in many uh, cases is niche and they've been brainwashed for for this enormous um, sum of money and they come out and they can't get a job anywhere and they become, you know, <laughs> they start working in coffee shops and complain about how the system is is wrong. And they're right. They're right. They're also the ones getting getting screwed in all of this. Totally. And I mean, as an academic, my heart bleeds for those people, those poor students, because of course, that's one of the reasons I went into the academic world, right? I mean, when I entered academia, I wanted to do research and I wanted to teach. I mean, very classic academic ambitions. I didn't really, you know, I mean, I really just suit the, the position of the classic academic very much to a T. It was like, that's perfect for me, right? I can say what I want. I can do research about the stuff I think is important and I can teach young people and, and help to, you know, lead them on their own intellectual journeys, right? Perfect. But universities today just don't prioritize. I mean, they give a lot of lip service to the welfare of their students, but in terms of actually prioritizing their students' welfare, a lot of the processes that they embark upon have the opposite effect. Right? And, and of course, because the bureaucracy is expensive, you've got to employ all those people, the costs of the education go up. And, you know, in, in, uh, in Australia, it's not as bad for the individual student as it is in some other countries. I mean, I have a son who just graduated from Boston University in May, and I am probably about half a million dollars poorer because of it. Right now, he, as it happens, he studied music and physics. And in those disciplines, there's not as much of the kind of brainwashing stuff that goes on, um, I think, then is and, and, and he did have to take a few broadening classes and things like sociology and psychology, and he had to hold his nose through some of those classes. Um, and he got most of the value that he got from his education through his own personal work on his own because he was a piano performance student. So just practicing, you know, his piano stuff and through physics lectures and physics experiments and physics research. So they still have good infrastructure for that, thank goodness. And through his extracurricular activities, he was a he was a music director of a boys, all boys acapella group for three years and sang in it for four or five years. And that was just an amazing experience, like a fraternity with music, right? And so I think that social benefit was, you know, maybe not worth half a million dollars, but yeah. it definitely <laughs> worth a lot, right? Um, so, but but he was very lucky. He happened to be in those disciplines and happened to take those kinds of opportunities. I could imagine many of his classmates doing other kinds of specialties who come out exactly as you describe, right? Now, Boston University is a bit better than some of the local universities in 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 that in Boston in that it has as part of its mission very explicitly that it, it wants to be responsive to the needs of the Boston community. And that's something that, again, I think is we've, we've lost that a lot in Australia. We really, we give a lot of lip service to it, but at the end of the day, what is it that the universities in Sydney are doing for the people of Sydney? I mean, it would be nice to have a conversation about that with the VCs and, and really ask, you know, I mean, are we just doing these big showy things like the festival of big ideas, you know? Okay, so you have some things people can go to. Are you improving the lives of people in Sydney? What are you doing about the housing crisis? What are you doing about the cost of living crisis more generally? What are you doing about the, the over-education problem? What are you doing about childcare? 
What are you doing? You know, all these different policy areas that we could talk about. What about inflation? Right. I go on this on the news all the time talking about inflation. What, you know, what are we doing? I mean, I try to help through my engagement with the community, but, you know, and some of my research, of course, also very much responsive to, you know, what are we going through right now as a society and, and how can I try to help with some intellectual leadership, but I don't get rewarded for that within the academy. Forget about that, right? My my career incentives are to get published in top quality journals, right? Which is basically journals that maybe 10 people in the world will ever really read or even understand if they do read. And they're not really connected to the to the plight of real people in the societies paying our salaries. So we have lost that tether to, to, to the needs of our community. And I think that's another thing that the bureaucracy sort of obscures you have this massive bureaucracy which can generate massive amounts of propaganda basically you know justifying its own existence and and people just forget about the basics that you know the basic brief of the university be in a place of learning and intellectual leadership to help the society that pays your salaries please you know it'd be great if we got back to core business there just as it would be great if, if government got back to core business do you think that there are any universities in Australia that are maybe leading the way to um, being better at helping their local communities? Well, there are definitely some that have a very different idea about how to educate people. So Campion College is one that I happen to know about um, that's uh, in the Sydney area. It has a very religious bent. Uh, and a lot of the universities that are trying to do this in the States also have a religious bent. So Hillsdale College, um, New College in Florida in the, in the US is one that um, Ron DeSantis has been trying to shake up and kind of make more responsive, I think, in a way. But, you know, he may also be injecting his own politics there. So it's, I don't see a brilliant example in Australia yet, but I am working, as you know, with my co-author Paul Friders to um, draw blueprints for what we think a new enlightenment university would look like. That's what we call it. And, uh, and I think within the next five years, there's at least maybe a 20 or 30% chance that we'll actually get that off the ground somewhere. Whether it'll be in Australia, I can't tell you. Australia is a pretty hostile environment for, <laughs> for such a thing. So it might be more likely in the US or Europe. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine how they would not choke you out with regulations especially if you know the, the whole point that you're making is that the, their big honeypot is uh <laughs> is obsolete and, and unnecessary <laughs> yeah. um yeah. is there any way so is uh, other than uh starting up a new university or you know with some new blueprint is there any way to reform universities or scale them back uh any possible way that that could happen do you think well, I mean, I've certainly suggested more um, sort of high level reforms to multiple different kinds of bureaucracies, uh, in particular, this idea of citizen juries. So maybe mention that just briefly. So one of the things we observed during COVID, as we've said, is that there were all these bureaucrats making decisions for which they were completely unaccountable to the people who they were supposedly serving. And the reason for that is because the tops of bureaucracies these days are, are appointed by politicians. They are political appointments, right? The top of the Department of Education or the Department of Defense or Department of Trade. So the idea would be that you use the citizen jury system, just as we have in the criminal jury system, right? Where you're on a jury roll and you might get called up. Um, you might not like this because it is it would be potentially a compulsory thing. If you're in Australia, you have to be on this jury roll. And in expectation, once in your life, you get called up to serve two or three months with a collection of 20 or 30 other people. And your sole job is to appoint the next, say, head of the Department of Education or head of the Department of Defense. And the idea would be that, you know, a representative group of Australians are just as good, if not better, at doing that in a way that is responsive to the people as a politician would be. In fact, probably better because a politician wants to reward his friends and, you know, create this network of gray gifts that he yeah, can- Yeah, almost certainly off, better. <laughs> right, exactly. So, so the idea would be if you establish this system and then you start putting all of the tops of the bureaucracies into this system, then after a few years, you end up with a cadre of people who have been appointed by the people, truly the people in a democracy, rather than by politicians. And this would then potentially mean that the decisions being made in those bureaucracies were more responsive to the people. And so if you talk about university structures, if there were decisions made by the Department of Education that had to do with university structures, funding, you know, anything, those would hopefully be a little bit more responsive to the people. So that's one idea. Uh, we, we are we are close to the to the hour mark, and I I, I do do want to ask you at least something uh, about COVID because obviously you you gained a lot of attention about during the COVID period, and we've touched on a few various things. But there is um, 
uh, you know, at the moment, it's kind of easy for, for uh, not easy, but it's certainly easier for people like us to level criticisms at what the government has done, uh, the consequences of what's happened, point out all the various things that have gone, uh, that, you know, that, that were completely either unnecessary or intentionally, you know, uh, in the wrong direction. Um, because there's this kind of fog of censorship has, has lifted a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. certainly at the moment. Um, do you think that, say, uh, we were to restart, not necessarily COVID, but some similar crisis uh, again now, uh, the the world or Australia or, you know, um, any of us would be, do you think that the, the response would be any better to, than what it was for COVID? Oh, geez, I, I would love to say yes, but I'm afraid I have to say no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not not even with the, the 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 somewhat awakening that there has been um i i feel that the, the forces of um power that we had during covid are still there right we still have people who are who have the potential to call states of emergency and then force stuff down people's throats right we just have that ability and and yeah sure there'll be pushback but there'll be more censorship in response right i mean the people who have done this uh, still have most of the power, most of the money, most of the guns, most of the you know resources, right? So I think we still need five or 10 or 15 years of rebuilding and recognizing how bad it was. How badly did we get injured? Did we get abused by the people in power before we're going to recognize and be able to really, you know, write into our history books what happened in an accurate way? And and then also to rebuild in that period institutions which can replace the institutions that have been tainted during COVID, the Department of Health. I mean, I don't, I just don't trust him anymore, right? I don't trust, I don't trust my doctor anymore. You know, I don't trust, uh, you know, a lot of people in, in positions of power. Um, not that I really trusted them that much before, but certainly I've, I've seen the depths of depravity to which they would sink in order to keep and retain and, and, and grow their power, right? And it's disgusting. So I think more people have to be awakened to that, certainly, and that's going to take a long time. That's one of the reasons why I founded uh, with other colleagues the group Australians for Science and Freedom that you mentioned at the start. That's uh, scienceandfreedom.org. We have our inaugural conference in November at UNSW. So we'll be announcing that very soon on scienceandfreedom.org. So I would commend that group to your listeners. It's a cross-disciplinary resistance and restoration organization. And we intend to be basically a help to Australians all over the country who are wanting to rebuild their communities and rebuild some institutions to um, better serve their needs, basically, compared to the institutions that have failed them so badly during this period. So I think we need a period of rebuilding and continued awakening and continued reconciliation or sort of recognition of what happened and then uh, healing before we will really be in a position to say that the next time around, things will be different. Well, yeah, I'd worry that the response would be worse next time because as you touched on a few times earlier is there's no accountability. So if anything, they've learned just what they can get away with without accountability and probably know that they can push it even further next time. Yep. Yeah, that, that's that's a great point too. I was just going to say, I, I actually, I agree with you. I, I don't think we would do any better. I was just trying to make the... I've been told I'm too pessimistic about the the, the outlook on uh, on the world in the future. I was trying to be more optimistic, but no, I will never delve down that path again. Thank you. <laughs> there is no optimism, Pietro. Don't get me wrong. I do want to leave on an optimistic note. I do think in the end, there is no way that the globalists and the and the power hungry people will win. There's just there's there are lots of reasons to think that we will win in the end, but it's going to be a long slog. It's just not right now. Um, as I say, 10, 20 years, maybe in the future. Uh, I like to think that my my grandchildren will uh, be in a much brighter world. Yeah. And I mean, I, uh, if, if we truly believe there was no hope, we wouldn't do what we're doing and you wouldn't do what you're doing. So, I mean, pessimistic, but uh, but hopeful. Is that, I think that's a, that's a good way to put it. Um, we had better wrap it up there that we, we are up past the hour mark now. Thank you so much, Gigi, for, for coming on. Uh, we, uh, if you don't already follow us on Spotify, YouTube, Instagram, uh, Twitter, all the rest of those things. Um, any last thoughts before we head off? Just keep doing what you're doing. It's great. I, I love to have, you know, alternative media that are really unafraid to ask questions and engage with with uh, important social issues and i hope that your listeners take away from uh, these kinds of conversations things that they can talk about at the dinner table and in their professional circles so that we broaden the conversations awesome. thank you Gigi. Right. thanks so much Cheers. for having me on see you later